You're listening to the Beyond My Battle podcast. I'm your host, Martel Catalano. Part intimate, part informative, and wholly designed to support you in your journey, each episode combines personal stories with expert insights to explore the many themes of life with illness or disability. In this episode, we explore the many emotions we meet after receiving a diagnosis. While a lot of people know their diagnosis from the time of birth, many are met with one later in life. The discovery of an illness, disease, or disability, be it intentionally or by surprise, highlights a poignant emotional shift. Feelings of anxiety, depression, and denial often develop and have a ripple effect on various aspects of our lives. You're about to hear from three people who received different diagnoses in their teens and early adulthood. Our guests, Evan Smith, Nicole Handron, and Ben Fox, speak about the impact it had on their inner and outer landscapes, how getting a diagnosis influences everything from self-worth, identity, and behavior. We also get into how it impacted the relationships in their lives, both in negative and positive ways. Later in this episode, you'll hear from Dr. Gerard Costa, an expert in mental health, regulating stress, and the power of relationships for cultivating calm. I'm Evan Smith, and I currently have chronic pain, and I had Lyme disease. My name is Nicole Handron, and I am a 30-year-old mixed female, and I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 18. My name is Ben Fox. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Right now, I'm 36 years old. Diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. So I'm legally blind with a progressive retinal situation where like peripherally, I go blind more and more into a a pinhole of vision. My symptoms initially were bloodshot eyes. My whole left side was numb. I felt like pins and needles in my hand. I would hold a pile of change in my left hand and it would fall, like pennies would fall through the cracks of my fingers. And I'm like, what is this? I should have realized that I had retinitis pigmentosa or a progressive condition like my grandfather much sooner. But when I was in my teens, I just kept on going to the eye doctor and and my my prescription needed to change quite a bit too, my prescription glasses. And so I was like, oh, well, I just need to get my prescription changed. And I love sports as a young kid. I love sports and I was really, really good. And the coaches really thought I was a great player and I was getting really good spots and positions. I lived a life of a lot of hard labor and physical activity with sports and just always feeling like I had to prove myself. And it uh, got to a point where it all exploded and it brought me to uh, the deepest, darkest place and hit rock bottom. And um, since then, which is now about three years ago, I've been climbing out of the hole. I couldn't remember my words. Like I knew them in my head, but I would have to describe whatever it was that I was trying to say. For example, that square thing or that rectangle thing in the kitchen that keeps the food cold. And I would then I would come out and I would be like, oh, the refrigerator. You know, coaches, you know, they didn't quite understand. And, and some really great guy taking his time off, you know, from work to come coach a little league team. You know, seeing one of his star players not do as well as he used to, he doesn't have time to really sort that out. So, oh my gosh, this kid's got a progressive vision problem, you know, and he's really not seeing that ball coming towards him. It's not spaced out. And I was sitting there trying my best to see the ball coming towards me. It was a very intense wave. It was mainly anxiety, uh, everything driven by fear, um, but also the anger of how could I do this to myself? Why did I do this to myself? I felt like it was self-inflicted and, you know, my fear and everything is held in my gut. Um, Immediately, my gut seized up. I lost weight. I couldn't eat. Just continued to tumble from there. And, you know, I was doing weightlifting before then uh, for not the right reasons, not for health reasons. And I didn't understand what I was doing. I was doing it too hard. And it was just this storm of, you know, since I was five, treating myself a certain way, and then all of a sudden it came down all at once. Yeah, the emotions were extremely intense. So I was away at college, 
And I woke up one day with, like, super bloodshot eyes. That was the first thing. So we tried everything with that. And I kind of just kept going to school. So it was my second semester. I was an RA. My grades were great. I was involved in everything. Like, life looked great. So here I am experiencing these symptoms of who knows what. Something's going on in my body. So I don't really... think about it too much because I'm distracted by being in charge of my floor and, you know, doing my homework. People were just concerned, confused, and I would just make light out of everything that happened. So it was almost like I knew it might have been serious, but I didn't have time to worry about how serious it was, what it could be to just distract me from the path that I was on. Did that make me depressed or did I have depression? That's a good question. I'll tell you what, it sure didn't feel great to miss that ball when I tried my heart out and I could catch it the year before. Other kids were getting better. I wasn't. I was getting worse. Completely checked out. I didn't have a sense of humor anymore. What little I had to begin with. Just the inability to enjoy any moment or anything. Even watching a show, taking a shower, spending time with my girlfriend. There wasn't a single thing that was enjoyable because of the pain and the fear and the anger. So behaviorally, I was, I was a zombie. I was a zombie. Um, I wasn't uh, any kind of person that I've ever been in my entire life. It was total anxiety because I didn't know why I was like experiencing these things every day. And I had to keep like lying as to, because I didn't know what to say. So I would just get up and laugh at myself in, you know, defense for myself to, to pr- protect my save face. So while I didn't know what was going on with me, I had to still keep my bubbly personality and still do everything that I was going to do and stay me. When the diagnosis of legal blindness hit me, it hit me really hard. And I I just like went, okay, okay, so what do I do now? I just decided to become uh, a traveler and I started traveling and, and taking any jobs I could that would help me to travel so I could see as much of the world while I could. Am I going to feel like this forever? And if I do, there's no way I can even last, you know, at the deepest point, there's no way I can even last a few days. How am I going to last even a few days more of this type of what I feel, what I was feeling? If I want to go on a date, I have to say, hey, how about picking me up next Friday, seven o'clock? And um, I will tell you when I realized I was going blind that that was so important to me. So maybe that's why it's like important to me now is like when I realized that I was going to not be able to drive, I got the awesomest cars. Like I did ridiculous amounts of work to buy awesome cars, like with convertible like features. And I'd go and pick people up and drive them around and take girls out on dates. And it was really fun for me. Um, I really can't even, like, I don't remember the day where I was like, okay, I'll, you know, shoot this drug into me. I think it was just, I was tired of doctor shopping. And once I realized you can live with MS and how common it kind of is, and that I have the best form, quote unquote, you know, that I could live with it. And I guess this is what it is. Let's try this drug. Cause I was tired. It was like two years later and I'm 18, just trying to be in college. Yeah. There was fear of Well, at the time I was thinking of checking out and there was fear of what everyone, how everyone would feel, how everyone would think. Yeah, fear of it, you know, uh, affecting my girlfriend's life and, you know, can't travel and, and live a, live a life that I would have liked to, you know, not being able to sit down for 15 minutes. That's, that's the, the place that I was in. Um, even lying down, you know, there's no comfortable position, but thinking of going somewhere in a car or in a plane was no, no way. And so massive fear there. You know, if I feel like this, that means that I can't do anything. And, and it was all, it was all assumptions. And that's, that's what fear is. It's, you know, the assumption of what might happen. But uh, basically I thought my life was over. With the chronic condition, I have some friends and maybe even myself at times I've said, because of my condition, this or that, let me say that again, because of my condition, this or that, I can't do this. I can't have a relationship. I can't have kids. I've said those things for sure. Absolutely. But I want to say, you know, life is complicated. Lots of people have divorces for all sorts of reasons. Yes. Going blind. That's true. Yes, it's likely I'll pass this on if I have my own children. Very likely. 
those were my excuses. Those were the tip top excuses of why I got divorced. Because of where I was in my life, I was anxious to get back into school. My anxiety was, how do I get my life back to where it just was, seemed to be going on the right path. So first and foremost, I needed to, yes, I came home to find out what I had or what I was blessed with. <laughs> and then my, next was like, I need to stay in school to stay focused. So with all of the anxiety, how is this going to affect me having kids? Um, is my body going to be okay after? Should I still be able to work out? What should I eat different? Am I going to be able to pass the test? Am I going to be able to, you know, live a long, long life? That was my biggest thing. Then the light bulb went off like, oh my gosh, is my life going to be shorter because I have multiple sclerosis? The anxiety alone will make you not want to be around people. You don't want them to see it. You don't um, oftentimes you don't want to talk about it, especially if you don't feel comfortable that the person that you're going to be talking to is going to listen or understand. Even if they don't understand, it's okay as long as there's an ear that's listening. That's very important. Even if you say nothing, just listen to someone that's more powerful sometimes than having a conversation. For me, I feel like it's important at this stage in my life, if I was going to be dating somebody, that we're going the same direction. And so it's like, if somebody wants to have children, you know, that's it's huge. It's like, okay, well, I do. But there's all these hangups before then and, and things I'm personally have to work through. You can go on and on of the anxieties that I was feeling, but pretty much, am I gonna, is somebody gonna love me? What's my family gonna say? How do I stay me and adopt this thing that I have to live with forever? How I retaliated against having adopted multiple sclerosis, I was now becoming more promiscuous because I was so, like, I don't, nobody's going to hurt me. I'm already hurt by this thing that I don't know what is going to happen next day to day. So let me just not fall in love with a person because that's asking for a, a heartbreak. But I still want to feel those feelings. I just want to, you know, have a good time, but not get too close just in case. So my parents at the time were in Florida, so this happened in February, but uh, so they weren't around. So it was very difficult for family to understand what was really going on um, without seeing it. Initially, it brought us closer, being able to talk about some deeper feelings that I had denial of my whole life and for them to share stories of their own lives and learning from each other. Friends were very supportive in the same way, but it was the very deepest feeling that no one understood. And, you know, they'll tell stories of troubles in their life. And in the end, what I was actually experiencing, I f truly felt was tremendously deeper. And I, I don't mean to compare, but I, I just, I, I, f I felt alone. That's what happened to my grandfather. And he went deaf and blind. And before he passed away, you know, my family had to watch him go deaf and blind. And it was the strangest thing to me as a kid that my grandfather was blind but could still see. And it was something we never spoke about. We just never spoke about it because he had to drive every once in a while. And then when he was like in his 50s, he just like it was just never drove. But there was a car in his driveway. But every once in a great while, you'd see him drive down the street along this, the shoulder for whatever reason down to, you know, the dock or the end of the street. And uh, until one day, they finally, finally took his license. And, uh, yeah, we never really talked about how he did drive or how he shouldn't drive uh, to him. So for my grandma, she was one to, she's old school. So she's like, don't tell anybody you have this disability. It might prevent you from getting a job. You know, keep it hush hush and just deal with it yourself. Kind of like emotions when back, back in the day, that's what they did. So she was just warning me if I told the wrong person, it could affect my future. Just play it safe and don't tell anybody. So I did that for a while. And I kind of was in my own shell, just dealing with it, making light of it, not really letting too many people know, um, just talking to my main supports about my diagnosis. But there were such opinions about me and how I was going to live from now on that it, I was like, well, I thought I had this, not anybody else. Uh, my girlfriend 
just talked of joy and of the all the things that there are to look to look forward to and she just told me all the best things about myself and it made me cry very hard that I hadn't done in I don't know a decade and that was another door that was opened that was huge to start to heal and it doesn't matter who you are um, the emotional center the love center it uh, it's got to cry <laughs> it has to cry recently I was uh I was brought out by a, a, a gentleman who's blind, also with retinitis pigmentosa, to work with him on a project. And and I just went and stayed at his house. And he's got a son, and uh, he's playing catch with his son, literally throwing stuff over to his son. And his son, they they just practiced so much. His son's able to like throw it to him in a way that he's just got his hands out. Son throws it right there. Dad catches it. The son right now is like ten or eleven or so. And his mom, she's doting on the son and the dad, and I'm having a great time. And she sees it. She says, hold on, hold on. I want to show you a, a craft that he made, an arts and crafts. And he was three years old. So she she goes out, and she brings in this uh, this piece of paper that's tactile art. And if, if, if that's the first time you've heard that term, tactile art just means you can touch it. And it's, it's, a, it's a portrait of his father that he made tactile art with. And the dad at the time, when he made this tactile art, had a beard. And so he had these little cotton balls he'd cut up and pasted on there, little buttons for eyes, you know. And he had, like, little little construction paper that he'd cut up and made, like, spaghetti hair with, basically. And it was awesome. It was really awesome. And uh, and the mom was like, so this is something he made on his own. And the teacher was so blown away because – this is a kid saying without without having to be asked or, hey, let's make a tactile thing for your dad because the kid just knew how much the dad would love that. And I was like, this kid loves his dad and the kid gets to have this incredible experience growing up with him. And that did something in my heart. And that was like, it was like, and it came at the best time for me too because it was like, that was right then. I had just barely, you know, started uh, getting back out in the world again. The two of us are equally supportive of one another. And when we have emotions or become irrational, which we all do, there's the other half that's there to, to talk to you and to calm you down. And even if it's just physical, like I need my shoulders rubbed or, you know, just having someone that's willing to do whatever it takes to ease any discomfort brings on safety, <laughs> joy. And uh, I couldn't imagine life without it, honestly. When I was diagnosed, my dad at the same time got diagnosed with cancer. So he was the one who was there showing me how to take my medicine and helping me how to shoot my leg and back and arm um, with the needle. And I hope I don't cry. So he was dying at the same time I was, you know, gaining this friend of mine. So he was the one that kind of understood, and he was the patient one, and actually believed, without seeing that I had MS, believed that I do have MS, and accepted it immediately, and wanted to do anything, run to my rescue. And then my dad passed a few months later. So my mom was like, well, you can work out still. You can function. I can't see it, so you're fine. And I kind of got upset, <laughs> but... Now she understands, and and so now that there's more knowledge w within my family, now we can almost healthily joke, oh, I have MS, like, or when I trip, you know, I'll be like, oh, it's my MS. So that's like my family's running joke. Life is this process, and going blind is tough. And here's something I really want to say about that, and this is so important. I've heard it said that depression is simply the inability to visualize yourself in the future. And like that hits me so hard because if you've got a progressive condition, a progressive or a chronic condition, like how can you really, really plan? How can you really, really put something on the schedule? How can you really know where your condition's gonna be at in five or 10, 20 years? It's like, you gotta be able to trust yourself. And, and it's like, you gotta be able to trust the people that are around you. And you have to be able to trust the experience that you're all going to have because there's going to be people with you regardless and you're going to be with people regardless. So just trust yourself.
and then have the best experience you can have. It's simple. And that's what I took away from that experience, hanging out with my man, David Furukawa and his son, Will. The Lyme was something that I felt in me energetically, and I couldn't ever put my finger on it. You know, just pain throughout every limb of my body and grogginess and just, I didn't know what it was. So getting the diagnosis of it actually being Lyme was relieving to know that I could put a name to it and say, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to defeat you. That was important. Since I've adopted, MS has made me such a stronger person. I will shout it at the top of the buildings. I will shout it from the mountains. I am so proud to have multiple sclerosis, and it's made me such a stronger person and pushed me that much harder because statistically I'm not supposed to be able to accomplish half the things that MS has pushed me to accomplish. I wake up sometimes and I think about how I've lost driving because I had a dream about something I did in driving and I'm so excited I wake up I forgot about my condition. It's it's deep though. It's so deep because it's it's those times that you have these emotions that are so raw and you're, mo you're most vulnerable because you haven't had the day's experiences to carry with you while you think at that moment. And you don't have the next 10 things you're going to do to distract you from that moment. And really, depending on your exact situation, but often enough, you're just alone in that moment with that moment and need to get back to sleep so you can go on with your day tomorrow. At those times, it's an opportunity to choose and it can happen over and over again, that opportunity to choose. Somebody once told me that somebody who's fit can take care of themselves and carry a little bit of extra weight. And so regardless of our fitness with our specific health, like literal health, whether it's like, I don't know, blindness in my case or any other chronic condition, we can be fit and feel good about being fit and in that choice by being able to carry our weight and just a little bit more. And so when that choice comes up on those sleepless nights, thinking about things that are fair and not fair, man, that is just a cycle. It's just a, it's just a hamster wheel of, of a way of thinking, cause, and it's real. That's why it is a choice. And I choose to be fit, and I choose to remember I am I am fit. I can definitely carry my weight and a little bit more. And so that's why it's so important to have community. Like we can't control some of the things that are taken from us. It's true. It's super, super true. Some things are going to be taken, but we can control how much we can give. And we can give to each other. And that is something that <laughs> it's awesome because by giving to each other, we actually build something that's real and it's lasting. It lasts forever. And that's love and relationships. And love is a byproduct of relationships, healthy relationships. And love, it can just keep growing and it's contagious. It's obvious there's no one way to meet a diagnosis. I talked to Evan, Nicole, and Ben separately and was super moved during each conversation for such different reasons. Feelings of complete despair can be turbulent, but also transformative. We wanted to better understand the reasons we respond to diagnosis in these ways, and also why so many turn to relationships during this time. So I sat down with Dr. Gerard Costa, who explains this unique kind of stress and why relationships play such a key role in managing it. My name is Jerry Costa, and I am the director of the Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health at Montclair State University in New Jersey. It's great to have you, Jerry. Thanks for talking with us. We know it's common to experience feelings like anxiety and aloneness, sadness, shame after receiving a diagnosis. What comes to mind for you when you hear this? I think a good place to begin really is this amazingly complex thing we are, we humans. We probably are most aware of our immediate feelings, you know, what we think about something, what we feel about something. But in point of fact, what we feel in this moment can be regarded as the headline of a longer story. 
that is embedded deeper within our minds, our brains, and, and our bodies. The primary, maybe primal reaction is to feel fear, uh, to worry, to feel that you're not able to do the things, execute things in the world that uh, you thought you could or others are doing. So I know in your work, you do a lot of work with relationships, um, especially relationships where someone has been diagnosed with some kind of medical issue challenge. What is it about relationships that are so transformative when we're met with a life-altering challenge in this way? We humans are, from the first moments of life, relying on the relationships in our lives. When a change has happened in your lives, when there is either a disability in your child or you are struggling with the loss of something, the things we can say with conviction and with passion and with science behind it is that relationships will help you and can help you co-regulate to really adapt to this new normal, this new reality, to sort of recognize that you had an ability you no longer have, but that relationship can actually alter the very brain systems that often get activated when you become anxious or upset or depressed or sad. When relationships are really involving um, someone who is very attuned to and feeling with another, that person's brain system begins to develop accordingly. Their brain systems reflect that kind of calmness and connectedness with someone who feels with them. So when we don't feel safe or when we feel worried and anxious and upset, uh, it compromises our ability to feel calm and alert and regulated. Regulated meaning that you can handle the different experiences in your world without either over uh, withdrawing or, or becoming overwhelmed. It's those times that the relationships in our lives really are most important. And those relationships are primarily, primarily conveyed to us through our affect, our intonation of voice, our gestures, our pacing, our movements. Any big change can be stressful, and there's no one person really on earth who will make it through life without some kind of experience from which they have to majorly adjust, right? But why is it perhaps magnified for those who have an illness, a disease, or a disability? From the first moments of life, our requirement is to manage stress. There may be times that someone is born with a biologically based difficulty in brain systems and sensory systems that render them more anxious. They don't engage with the world. So they may begin the world with some biological stressors. People who acquire a disability through illness or injury may actually then have this biological difficulty that is compounded by their own emotional reaction to what has happened to them, their sadness, their worry, their wondering about what life will be like. And that can lead them to have cognitive ideas that kind of run through their mind all the time. I'm not good enough. I'm not adequate. I'm defective. I'm deficient. And on top of that, that can be felt in social domains. Those people might tend to feel less interested in relationships with others or less worthy of relationships with others, and they may feel uncomfortable in social situations where others are doing things they cannot do, or others appear less sensitive to the difficulties the individual is having. And then finally, there's this thing called pro-social stress. We kind of feel badly for those other people in our lives who maybe are affected by what we're going through. We disappoint them by not being able to do things because of our struggles with their disability, or we may feel uh, angry at them because we're not getting the kind of care we need from them. It's pretty obvious to me as someone living with a rare disease and disability myself, and I'm sure to anyone out there listening with or without a diagnosis, that it's common for people to to feel like the ways our earlier guests felt. So what I really want to know is what can be helpful to people? What can they do? There are two things that come to my mind as I think about, you know, what can people do? 
One is for people to take the risk of sharing what they're feeling with someone that they trust. I mean, there are many times when we have a private experience of being sad or depressed that we can begin to feel that no one will ever understand us. No one will ever know what it's like for us to feel, for them to feel the way we do. And I think the first thing I would want to say to people is please take the risk in sharing what you are going through with someone you trust. It is absolutely the case that we often fear to share our private experiences with others for fear of being rejected or feeling a sense of shame that we are deficient or even feeling a sense that we won't be understood. Just the opposite is true. When we share those things that are most silent within us, we are almost always met by someone who can show care and concern to us and understand it. And I think the second thing, and it's a related thing, is each of us has this fundamental need to be understood by someone. I think the loneliest thing and the most difficult thing for anyone to have is to feel that there's no one who can understand what they feel like or are going through. Uh, that is isolating. That is not, by the way, our human condition. It's a biological imperative to be connected. Our brain is a social brain. Our psyche, our minds are social uh, experiences. They are co-constructed by others. So take the risk of sharing and really understand that you will always do better when you feel understood by others. For additional resources on how to reduce stress post-diagnosis and ways to secure supportive relationships, download our ebooks at beyondmybattle.org. This show is presented by Beyond My Battle, a nonprofit helping people manage the stress of illness and disability. All of the organization's resources, like this podcast, are rooted in mindfulness, awareness, and compassion to help individuals and care partners live happier, healthier, and more resilient lives. To support the podcast or any of our other programs, visit beyondmybattle.org backslash donate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share with your family and friends.